Simmons and ended up going to MIT. Oh, got it. Uh, ended up going to MIT for computer science. While at MIT, really involved in a startup ecosystem. Luckily, MIT had a huge CS ecosystem, lots of app developers, lots of web developers, lots of actually crypto developers at the time, uh, you know, 2012. And so I, I pretty much like fell in love with the startup world, right? It was like, look, you can, you know, code something over a weekend. It was hackathons that got me into it. And this concept of you can take a weekend, build something, and, you know, the next week you're going to have people using it. And then, you know, I'd see what pe what happened to people after that. They, they'd quit, they'd drop out, they'd raise money, they'd go to YC. And I was like, hey, you know, I, I can do that too. If all I need to do is learn how to code. And so, you know, I kind of became a coder, but developer, but really with that end state of mind of like, okay, I want to go start a company. So while I was in college, tried to start a couple of companies. They, they didn't really work out. I worked on an app to help people automatically file copyrights more easily uh, before realizing that was really kind of a bad market to go into. And so, you know, after working on a couple apps, I was like, All right, I want to go get a real experience, real job. And so I um, had interned at Intel and realized I was never going to learn from at a big tech company. So ended up going to a very small startup called Kensho. We did fintech. And I worked there during school and after school, uh, saw them grow from six people to 150 and ultimately exit for $600 million. So really like struck it lucky in the startup lottery, you know, working somewhere that ended up being a rocket ship. Um, and while I was doing that, uh, you know, that was kind of how I got my operating experience, got my feet wet. Uh, I was also investing. There was this group that came to town called First Round Capital. They were the original seed fund, kind of invented the concept of the seed fund. And they were basically formed this group called Dormant Fund, which was students investing in other students. So they came to campus. They're like, hey, how would you like 500K to invest in your fellow students? I'm like, hello, welcome to campus. I was running the entrepreneurship club. Uh, so they put me on a team and we uh, deployed it into 20 startups and you know, learned a ton about investing that, that I can share. But basically exited college, having run a venture fund and having worked at a rocket ship startup. Um, kept working at that startup for two years, uh, right before they exited. And it was honestly like a shit show of a company. Okay. Like it was a great engineering team, great sales, but you know, product was a little bit, uh, shaky, you know, uh, we had a big rift. The engineering team was in uh, Cambridge. The business team was in New York, but you know, kind of saw how they did it and, and it wasn't perfect and seeing it from the inside and thought, okay, if they can navigate a company to a $600 million acquisition, then I could also start a company. So quit Kensho two years after graduation to start a company called Synapse. We were building AI to automate airport x-ray security screening. So basically when you go through an airport, you like take your bag, put it through the belts, it goes through the x-ray machine. We would analyze that x-ray and say, okay, does that bag have a knife or a gun or explosives in it? Um, built that over the course of three years. Uh, I was a CEO. We built it to a team of 15 and the tech worked. Uh, we were deployed in Japan. We were deployed in the US. We were in a few other countries around the world and, you know, really had a blast, you know, built some AI that actually worked, built out an international distribution network um, and uh, navigated that ultimately to an acquisition by Palantir Technologies. Uh, we so, you know, got acquired by Palantir, but, you know, that three years, uh, you know, I learned a lot, right? Obviously a lot of learnings there of starting with an idea with something that's so big, you're selling to the government, which is ultimately the most enterprisey of enterprise sales. <laughs> um, so navigated that in the process, we raised $6 million of capital from funds like Founders Fund, 8VC, Village Global. So some, some really tremendously incredible funds and a team of 15, which is what I'm proudest of. We, we had an awesome team. So. Got acquired by Palantir, learned a lot along the way. And ultimately part of the reason we got acquired was um, very similar to my college learnings. Turns out it wasn't a huge market. Like I, I don't think it was a multi-billion dollar market. And even if it was, the hardware and the government sales cycle made it that it wasn't quite an exponential growth. It would have been a lot slower growth than we expected. And so the exit made sense for us. I spent a year at Palantir as a product manager and there I took what I learned from Synapse and, and applied it to the DOD. So I was the PM for their AI platform. Had a blast doing cool shit with the government. Some stuff I'm not allowed to talk about. Ultimately, uh, I was getting paid very well. The golden handcuffs were very golden, very tight. Uh, so I spent a year there, had an amazing experience, but you know, my heart and soul is ultimately in, in startup world. So quit that about two months ago um, in May and focused on two things. One is investing. 
um, raising an early stage fund uh, with two partners that are MIT alums and the others operating. I have a fintech startup. Uh, we got to work with you guys. Uh, we save startups money on SaaS tools. Uh, so basically we have SaaS discounts and we host SaaS discounts from the VCs you're a part of and the vendors that you use. So that's what I'm focusing on now and you know, building. So generally traveling around here in Miami at the hackathon, we'll spend a month in LA with a bunch of founders. So just, yeah, back to doing what I love, just building stuff and, and meeting founders. So, you know, Pablo reached out. He's like, we got this program. There's a bunch of amazing founders. I'd like, you know, I'd love to come meet you guys and uh, share whatever uh, wisdom I may be able to share with this awesome group. Awesome. Um, what made you go into that space? That's like a very specific um, idea to solve or problem to solve. Were you like, what, like, how did that come to you? Yeah. Uh, it, so it was like, I knew I wanted to start a company, but I didn't know what kind of company I wanted to start. And so it was very opportunistic. An old classmate of mine, Ian, he had done research at MIT on the human cognitive science of TSA screeners. So he did the research that showed they miss 95% of dangerous items that people try to sneak it through airports. Like when they actually try to sneak it in, 95%. And so he was telling me, he's like, hey, look, it's, it's still so bad that stat had just came out. Why isn't this automated? And so he kind of had that subject matter expertise. I had been very close to AI during my time at Kentra. So I knew very intimately, hey, the tech is now good enough. The computer is good enough. The detection is good enough. The classification is good enough. There's no technical reason we shouldn't be able to build this. And so kind of combine that subject matter expertise, that knowledge of the problem with that knowledge of the tech, decided to start the company. And we knew we didn't have the knowledge of the customer. That, you know, what's the sale? What's their persona? How do they think? And so we actually spent about five months while we had our jobs, kind of diligencing the market, doing research, networking our way into the government to understand that customer profile. How do they think? What motivates them? What would make them buy it? And what are their KPIs uh, that would make it a success? What's their willingness to pay? And when we had that information, then we're like, okay, we got the problem. We got the, you know, the willingness to pay. We got the validation. We got the tech. We had recruited an AI co-founder, a third co-founder. And then that's where like, right, let's Let's start this company. We got all the ingredients here to go raise a pre-seed and, and start building. That's awesome. So how, what did it look like after you guys spent those six months validating the market um, for you guys to have a three-year timeline to acquisition, you guys were moving really, really quickly. So what did it look like? Like, I guess like the product feedback iteration loops or like the product development cycle, what did that look like for you guys after doing that, that uh, market validation? Yeah. So, you know, what I would say is when you think about, you know, technology development, right, the software development life cycle, it's, it's agile, right? It's like you, you know, you, you design, code, test, get feedback, repeat, deploy, repeat. And, and it's sort of similar to that, except in the company world, the startup world, it's like the de-risking life cycle, right? Like how do you continuously reach milestones that, you know, dramatically decrease the risk in the business. Cause that's ultimately what's going to get you more capital, right? It's like, there's less risk of that capital. So the, the first dollar you get is the riskiest dollar you'll get. And from an investor's perspective, in additional dollars at our lower risk, which is why, you know, the valuation goes up and which is why you get the dollars at all. And so for us, we were always conscious of what are the biggest risks associated with the company, right? And so before we raise a dollar of capital is, do they want this? Would they pay for this? Could we sell it at all? So we, we build the best thing in the world and not be able to sell it or not be able to sell it for a high enough price to, to warrant it. And so once we, you know, kind of got the inroads to the TSA, the TSA is like, yes, we want this. We would pay for this. And we had an ex-TSA lead say, oh my God, like if you, if you, if you build this right, like we would pay, you know, whatever for it, you know, you could charge whatever you want. And then it was like, okay, now, can we actually deliver it to the TSA? And then the risk there was not the AI, but in our minds was the integration. And so we said, can we actually, let's say we build the best AI, let's say we sell it, can we actually deploy it? And so what we did there was we both built relationships with the x-ray machine companies 
We're like, we, we know we're going to need relationships with them. And we bought an X-ray machine and put it in our garage. And we're like, okay, we, we raised some pre-seed money, bought a hundred thousand dollar X-ray machine and, and like tinkered with it in the garage and said, okay, like we can integrate it with an X-ray machine and, and, and so on and so forth. Right. And so it was always, so then we went to investors, raise a pre-seed off, look, TSA is going to buy it. We have the channel partnerships, you know, the X-ray machine manufacturers aren't going to like block us out of the airports. Um, and the technical risk is reduced, the integration risk, the AI risk. And then it was like, okay, then it was, can you actually get it to work, right? Can, can you get it to work, right? There, there wasn't a fundamental technology risk. We had the AI background. We had worked on similar projects. So we de-risked like fundamental tech, but then it was like, okay, now show us that it actually works. <laughs> and so then we raised pre-seed to like build the model, get the training data, because there wasn't a fundamental risk. There was more as an execution risk of can they get that zero to one? Then we spent those three months, we, we found a customer in Japan from a, we put up a nice landing page and the Japanese airport was like, we wanna buy this, we're like, awesome. And then we went to Japan and, and trained our model on their data. And so then we came out of that and we said, hey, then the next big milestone was we have a model, it works, they're using it and we have a paying customer lined up. We have, uh, an, you know, an, um, we did a proof of concept, they're interested in paying, and they hadn't paid yet, but because this is such a big enterprise sale with such a long sales cycle, just de-risking that will, you know, that LOI was enough. So then we raised another $2 million, actually we raised another $3 million just on it's deployed. We have a customer. And so, and, so, and that's really what we kept on doing and, and going up to our series A, which we would have raised had we not exited, the MIG milestone would have been, can we prove that we can scale this thing? You know, we deployed it at one customer. Can we deploy it to, to 15? Um, and do they all pay? Is the integration easy? And so this was obviously like very enterprise sales, top-down sales, um, more of a, a hard tech thing, but that, that's how we thought about the, you know, milestones. Awesome. I'll ask one or two more quick questions and then we'll open it up to the founders. So um, how did you guys raise that pre-seed round? Oftentimes, raising that first round is the hardest, and a lot of our founders are at that stage where some of them have already raised it, but uh, some of them have a, a moderate amount of traction, and they're going to raise that. Um, and you know, they've been pitching a lot. So, what did that look like for you guys? Was it somebody a pre-existing relationship? Or did you guys have to pitch a ton? Did it take a lot of time? I mean, I'd say you know, so I'm an investor myself, right? And I, and I think at Dorm Room Fund, we used to have this this framework that we called, you know. Um, we call it a product market team because it rolls off the tongue, but it was really like team market product, right? And really the, the top two are the most important, right? The market and the team. That's what you have at the early stage because you don't have a product. And the like adjective, if I, if I were to add one prefix to it, it'd be like compelling team, compelling market. And before you have a product, you really have like a, a go-to-market, right? Is what I would say, right? So you got your team, you got your market, and then your go-to-market. Your team, who's building it? your market, what are they going after? And you go to market, how are they going to go after it? And so I'd say like for us, we had a compelling team. Ian was a subject matter expert. He had done a research. You know, we had an AI engineer on the team um, and we'd all been involved in the entrepreneurship space. So like our, you know, caliber as founders, my, my co-founder was going to MBA. He had actually started a company before. So like, all right, D, again, it's all about risk. De-risked tech execution on the team, de-risked, you know, business experience on the team. And we had gotten enough advisors to de-risk kind of that, um, that founder market fit, right? So we didn't have government experience, but we got advisors that have government experience. And so we had a compelling team. We had a compelling market. You know, I think we sketched out at the time, look, you know, we're, if we can really scale this in a low touch way, it's not just x-ray machines and security. It's also uh, customs and, and border protection. And it's not just x-rays. There's a lot of other modalities that we can expand to, you know, CCTV. By generally our market we pitched was not just x-ray security. It was visual security, uh, which is important, right? Because we had our bottoms up, our go-to-market was, you know, x-ray security. And, you know, initially go-to-market was leverage the TSA for validation and, you know, sell to big marquee airports that are influencers in the space and to slowly capture the rest of the airports. That was the bottoms up, that was a go-to-market. But the top-down TAM was like, we wanna become experts in visual detection, AI, visual AI. 
they didn't want to be experts in uh, security, the security realm. We want to be experts in customers in the security space. And so they like that market. They're like, yeah, visual detection, huge market, satellites, CCTV, x-ray, amazing. And go to market. Okay. You guys have a clear approach of like, what are you going to do in the next 18 months? As an investor, I'm always looking for like, is the team good? Is it a billion dollar idea? And are they going to raise a series A, right? Are they going to hit the milestones? And, and I think we, we taked all the boxes for that pre-seed check. Um, but then the seed stage, then it was like, I'd say pre-seed, it's not, are they going to raise series A? These days, it's more, are you going to raise a seed? Um, like, are they going to be able to raise a seed in six to 12 months, which we did. And then we raised the seed. They were investing based off of, do we think they can raise a series A in the next 12 to 18 months? And again, I think we had the ingredients to do that. But the biggest, you know, I, I get that question a lot from founders and, you know, they're like, hey, like, how do we get investors to invest? And honestly, it's like, is, is it compelling? And, but a lot, a lot of people get fixated on that. But the other one is like, is there urgency? Because if there's no urgency, there's no incentive for an investor to cut a check. So we created that urgency by saying, we're moving quickly. We're on the verge of closing these customers. And what they hear is, okay, the round's gonna get done because they have momentum. But also if we don't invest now, the price is gonna be higher in six months because they're about to achieve all these milestones. But if an investor doesn't have an incentive to cut a check today, if they think they can wait a week to cut a check, a month, cut a check, quarter, cut a check, they will. But we were very mindful of that and always made sure the narrative was pointing up and to the right. Love it. All right. Um, the floor is for the founders. So anybody can just jump on, ask a question. Jump in, ask away anything, fundraising, product, hiring, whatever. Hi, Bruno. Uh, I'm Jason. Um, so um, I guess what um, we're doing, it's really uh, like what you're doing, um, just leveraging AI um, in terms of um, a specific business area. Um, so at this stage, we have um, like completed our like um, MVP model, like the baseline one, um, but we had a hard time um, getting the data and the, the the advanced model um, to to um, attract more investment. So what? Um, so may I ask what uh, would the suggestion um, of yours be? Yeah. So the first question is, you guys are doing the shopping, clothing shopping comparison, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, there's so much data out there, and there's so much. There's so many off the shelf models you can use, I, I'd be hard pressed to believe you, you can't find. Like as an investor, yeah. my, my first thought is like, I have a very hard time believing that you can access training data and you can access models. Like what you're doing is not gonna be a model innovation, right? We, like when we used to talk about at Synapse, what is a moat, right? Like you can have a model innovation. Like we have a better, more advanced model. That's like really rare. Like unless you're doing something that no one has done before, we were doing like we actually had a model innovation that's not you okay then it's like is it a data innovation do we have data that no one else has uh you know either labels that no one else has or images no one else has also don't believe that's you then the, the third is just like do we have a better product ux or, or a better sales motion right and you're competing there on go to market you're competing on product thinking you're competing on knowing your customer and, and maybe having a slightly different perspective than your competitors and so that's what I would say, right? Like as, as, as an investor, I'd say like, I don't know, you, you like, again, I'm going to be like unfiltered with you guys. You're complaining about data in your model, but like, I'd say go out there and find data, whatever, like scrape Macy's, like uh, do whatever you got to do, scrape, yeah, Pinterest. Like th there might be a difference between, you know, maybe what you can use in production and, and get sued or like what you do for a demo to an investor or even what you release in a closed beta. Like when we did our demo, investors wanted to know, can they actually build computer vision? Before we had x-ray images, we built models on satellite images and said, hey, look, we can build computer vision. <laughs> like uh -huh. not, all of them, not all of them took our word for it, right? But we showed, look, we can build models, we can deploy models. So that's what I would say, right? Like it's the, that should not be a blocker for you. And then, uh -huh. then the other question is like, is it compelling, right? Again, going to, to market team and, and go to market. I think 
you might have a great team. My question would be like, do you have an AI person on your team or do you have a, a something like this is not going to be a deep tech innovation, right? So it ends up being, mm-hmm. do you have someone on the team that really has marketing or, or marketing chops? Like this is probably going to be more of a marketing play or it's going to be a, a sales play. But then beyond that, it's going to be, what is the willingness to pay? I've seen other companies like this. And if you're going consumer, willingness to pay is very low. And if you're going enterprise, then it's just you know a totally different product. That makes sense. Because there's a company here, there's a company here doing it. Um, and yeah, they're like using an advertising model. And it's just like, I would say the biggest challenge for you is going to be monetization and user acquisition above all else. Gotcha. Thanks. I don't know. Does that, that's not quite your, your, your question, but is that helpful at all? Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. Um, I just want really quick follow up. So, yeah. um, like, um, the, the first round of investment uh, you received, is that, is that before the, the, like, um, the data and model innovation or it's after? I mean, like, if you ask me generally, I would say the first round of investing is, so let's work backwards. Series A is usually you have something that works and we want to pour fuel on the fire right? Mm -hmm. Like you have a customer acquisition mechanism, you have product market fit. And if we give you $10 million, you will go like that. Like, like series A is like, you've shown this and you have like a dotted line that goes up and you know, that is a U shaped. And they're like, awesome. Like, let's give you money to get there. They're usually not taking product market fit risk. Uh, They're taking like scalability risk. So you sail back, then a seed round is, hey, you know, we think we have product market fit and we really want to lock it down, but we've, we've shown, we've validated it, right? Like we might not have validated it with data with traction, but, but we've validated, there's no like, there's no like fundamental risk usually, but we've shown, you know, we've got some traction we've got some users, maybe we have a wait list, whatever it is, but we've shown that we're, we either have product market fit or we have early signs of product market fit. And then you, you raise a seed round to really like lock in that product market fit or, you know, really, start to explore like how you can capitalize on that. And so then the pre-seed, you know, again, is like, how do you get to that product market fit? Is there a path to finding product market fit? And so it depends, right? Like some investors might invest based on, I like you, I have confidence that you'll get there based on your experience. Here's money. Like I, I have trust and faith in you as a founder, or they might say, I, I like what I'm seeing. Like, you know, you've got a good plan. You've got a really good idea already of how you're going to get to that market. I, I see how you're going to get to that product market fit. Um, but the pre-seed is the most varied, right? Or, or they just say, I like this market. It's a huge market. Um, it's a big problem. And here's money to go to go figure out the right solution. Um, but yeah, like uh, it's because the pre-seed motivations are so varied, it's going to be like your, your mileage may vary, right? If you get lucky and you find an investor that really likes you or really likes your market, you're golden. Otherwise, it's your job to convince them why it's a big market, why you're the team to go after that market, and why you have a good approach, a good go to market in mind of how you're going to actually make money and, and build a business around it. But it depends, right? Like if, you, if you're a repeat founder, pre-seed, yeah, again, look, I trust you. I know you'll get there. Um, if you're a founder in a hot space, they're like, oh, bam, hot space, big market, and you seem like you're not totally bad fit, go figure it out. But otherwise, then you get lumped into like, convince me why this is exciting, a good business, and you'll raise a seed round in the next six, 12 months. That makes sense. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks for happy to give Happy to give more specific advice, uh, <laughs> maybe, on, maybe on the tail end of this call, but trying try to make it as general as possible. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, who else has questions? Yeah, go for it. Whoever. Oh yeah, John, there you go. So I feel like our business has had trouble describing our market to investors in that because we're an identity product, a lot of our inbound customers are very, very varied. Like, you know, just this week we, we closed a school district But at the same time, you know, we're talking to a bank about staffing agents to do 
foreclosure properties because they need to be badged too. And so when we've talked to investors, a lot of the time being candid, they've said, what market are you actually in? And I guess what I'm trying to say is that because our product is very ubiquitous, do you have any advice on how we would present our, our, our TAM, our, you know, the, we've had trouble presenting those in a realistic manner. To yeah. So give me the like two liner about your product again. So we're a digital identity tool. Uh, we could either be as little as an ID badge, but we could also be as much as a turnkey compliance and risk management tool for your job site, for your facility or for your event. Yeah. So I'll give you two per, I'll give you two perspectives on how to think about this. The first is from a market sizing perspective, right? They want to know how big is the market. And when you're coming with the market size, it's often helpful to break it down so they so you can actually, you know, do the math on it, right? If you're like, okay, anyone that needs identity verification, okay, cool. Well, like, how do you how do you break that down? You know, you could break that down by um, uh, vertical you could say you know construction sites uh banks schools uh, you could also break it down by maybe um their particular needs you could say hey you know we work with highly regulated industries banking etc we also work with high security environments uh but like it helps do like if you're like hey our market is one trillion they're like hey, we don't believe you how do you get there and you say okay well let's break it down We've got schools, we've got banks, we've got this. There's That's what we did with Synapse. We said our market is visual security. Within visual security, there's x-ray security. Within x-ray security, you've got where our x-ray machines located. That's how we chose to break it down. We say there's 7,000 x-ray machines at airports around the world. There's 100,000 x-ray machines at secure buildings around the world that aren't airports. Uh, and there are you know, 2,000 x-ray machines at cargo terminals and customs terminals around the world. You know, And, and that adds up to you know whatever. 150,000 x-ray machines around the world that we can deploy our systems on. Um, and then, you know, hey, look, if we think we can charge uh, $100,000 per year per machine or $20,000 per year per machine, bam, that's, you know, multi-billion dollar market. So the breaking it down helps them have a mental idea of what are the markets you're going after and also like what are their commonalities, right? So for us, we broke it down into, right, like per- sites that do personnel screening, airports, courthouses, et cetera insights to do um, like cargo and custom screening, right? Uh, ports, uh, airport, you know, uh, airport basements. Um, and they can kind of understand that and do the math. That, that's one way. Like one way to think about it is how do you actually get to that big market number? How do you get to this being a billion dollar company? Um, and then how do I believe you that it's a billion dollar company? And then the other perspective, right? Okay, I'm convinced the market's big. Then the other perspective is, how do you actually get there? And that's kind of the, the bottoms up, right? When you're thinking about bottoms up, go to market, it's basically like, okay, in the next two years, how do you make a dent in that TAM? And there, what they're looking for is, you know, what are the commonalities in the customers that you're going after? Because that's going to dictate, like, is your sales material more or less the same? Um, is your sales motion the same? Is your marketing very similar? Can you sell to these customers, you know, kind of at the same time or in the same way, or are they totally different, right? Are you selling to schools and I don't know, like, are you selling to, you know, banks for employees and like daycare? I don't know, like how similar are they? So if you go and you tell me as an investor, hey, we sell to, you know, highly regulated, high security environments, such as banks and schools, I start to see, okay, like, they seem similar enough that it's not going to be distracting to go after both. But if they're wildly different, then I might say pick one and pick the one that's going to be the biggest over the next 18 months. So does that make sense? Because like when you're breaking it down for them, that's what they're looking for. Like, are there similarities? Are there commonalities? Do we think this team can actually go after? And then ultimately you're going to defend how you can get in front of those. Because if you can't break that down, then your team is going to be in disarray. Like, like if you're, if your market, let's say, let's say you don't, you don't group them, you don't segment them. Your market is really anyone that needs identity. Then like, what script are you going to give to your salesperson? What mailing, what, you know, outbound list are you going to give to your SDR? Um, what are going to be your marketing sites? Your marketing sites are not going to say anyone that needs security. You're probably going to have, 
What, what's your company called? It's called Virtual Badge. You're probably going to have Virtual Badge for schools, Virtual Badge for banks, Virtual Badge for construction sites. You're going to give your SDR a list of banks, your, you know, your other SDR a list of schools. So that's kind of like what's going into like the investor's mind. Like, how's this company going to actually operate? And so that's what we did for, you know, not necessarily for Synapse, but like, let's say of, um, you know, Maple, right? My current company, we're not saying we'll save any SaaS company money. We'll say, hey, we save venture backed SaaS companies money and our channels are venture capital firms. And so that gives us our economies of scale. Sorry, that's like a very long answer, but that's what they're, that's like the mental models that they start to form. And if you don't help them break that down, then they can neither do the top down math, nor they can imagine your company growing and succeeding in a bottoms up way. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks for your answer. I appreciate that. Um, and then, yeah, because it also goes toward like, do you understand who you're selling to, right? Because when you start making those profiles, you start to also, you, you get forced to think about who's your customer persona, right? Because I think that's the third angle, right? The first angle is uh, market size. The second angle is sales motion, go to market. But the third angle is also product. Like, who are you building a product for? Are you building a product for anyone that needs identity? Or are you focused on highly regulated, secure environments that have a very hierarchical org structure? Because um, that's going to influence what, what you're building, right? And ultimately, who you, who you get feedback from. Like, sometimes I, I meet teams that know exactly who they're selling to. Like, let's say, again, you're selling to highly regulated, high security environments. And then someone asks you to make badges for their hackathon right? They're going to have very different needs at a hackathon than a bank, right? And then your product team is going to be like, well, hackathon's a big market. Like we should listen to their feedback. Like how do you parse the feedback? And then et cetera, et cetera. So that's the third one. It's like, who are you actually going after? Because that's going to influence what your product looks like, where you focus, and ultimately what feedback you say no to, right? The best founders are the one that's like, hey, I got this feedback from a customer. It was not aligned with our roadmap, it was not aligned with our vision, it was not aligned with our market. And we decided cut them as a customer, stop supporting them, say no to them, et cetera. Like the most disciplined teams I know actually occasionally say no to a big customer because it's not aligned with their vision, their roadmap, their, you know, their story. Awesome. Um, I think Justin has a question. Hey, so just as a refresher, uh, String is a social news app. And I have a question in regard to growth. So we've actually met with a few VCs so far, uh, you know, to raise a pre-seed or a seed round. And it seems like we've gotten some really great feedback in regard to, you know, the product looks great, the team is effective, and, you know, um, we're making good progress. But it seems like the one thing that they're looking for that we don't have right now is a little bit more proof of product market fit and more growth. So I was wondering if you had any input in regard to like how much growth in terms of, you know, let's say number of users in what amount of time we need to, to really show these, uh, these investors that we have uh, product market fit and growth. Yeah. And, and sorry, what's the one liner again? It's a social news app, just one, one place for getting and sharing news. Yeah. So it's a couple of thoughts here. One is, they probably have questions about the, the fundamentals of the business. Like I would imagine if I hear social news app, I'm like, many have been tried. How do you, how do you monetize? Right. One is like, can you build a viable business around it? And then a lot of founders, I don't know, I'm going to speak for you say, okay, well, we, if you get big enough, you can figure out how to monetize. And then it's like, okay, how do you get big enough? And so how do you de-risk your ability to either build a viable, right? There's like two ways to build a business like that. Either you charge money, you make money or you build it, you are just trying to get huge. So question to you, like, which one are you going after? Wait, sorry, what, what, what are the like, two options again? Like, I would imagine if I was business, I guess, either you can create a premium app that people pay for, generates revenue from day one, or you create a, a, a free app or, you know, a, yeah, free app that you plan to get a ton of users and then either do ads or figure out monetization later. So question for yeah, you, like, you. What, is your, so what is your growth model? I would say that we're focusing on the latter. We're trying to get as many users, users as possible, have it share with, you know, have them share it with as many of their friends as possible. And then we'll monetize later with ads and a subscription. Yeah. So 
there's a couple of things. One, there's two, there's two things that I think of. One, the, there's a risk in your ability to actually make it big, right? So does your team have experience with growth hacking, with brand, with design, or have you shown an ability to get go viral, to get in front of a lot of people, to build a virality into the app, or is the product just so damn good that you know, you're at the top of product time, you're at the top of hacker news. Like that's, it's no longer good enough to have a good app. Like you, growth is in and of itself a specialty uh, that, you know, they look for. Like, do they have, you know, the, the it factor to grow like a weed, right? That's number one. And number two, if they grow like a weed, if they get huge, can they actually flip on the... Um, that monetization, right? And one might be, do you have a really thoughtful approach of how you're going to turn it on, when you're going to turn it on, what kinds of ways you might be able to monetize? Um, or at the very least, uh, yeah, because like ads is not a great industry anymore. Uh, the ad marketplaces are getting really expensive. Um, like they're no longer super cheap, right? Because it, the your profit is their margin, right? Or, you know, your profit is their potential margin. So ads have gotten really expensive. Privacy laws are getting stricter. And so like, we're going to get big and then tack on ads is no longer like a winning pitch in Silicon Valley because they're going to ask, prove to me that you can get big quickly. And two, how do I believe that you'll be able to make money once you're big, right? And so- you know, more, more traction is a really lazy way of saying like, I don't like you now, but I might like you if you come back with something really special. Right. And, and so it's like, there's probably not anything specific they're looking for. They're more just like, it goes back to that urgency. That's what I said earlier. They don't have any reason to invest now because your round's probably not going to, in their mind, either the round's not going to get done and they can wait a month, two months, three months and get like strictly more information about your business. And again, invest the same amount of money with much less risk. Gotcha. And just yeah. one other question real quick. Um, do you know how Silicon Valley feels about selling data? Because that's actually one, um, you know, monetization strategy that I didn't mention earlier. You know, we're, I mean, we plan to have a, an enterprise suite where we, we sell really data. Really hard. If you have California users, you've got CCPA, you've got all these restrictions. You've, if you make more than $25 million or you sell data on more than X amount of users, like, Silicon Valley, look, whatever makes money, makes money, but selling data is becoming increasingly hard, right? And so if you're going to that pitch, I hope you understand the nuances of CCPA, of GDPR, of how you actually sell that data, who you sell that data to, but, um, you, you know, you really got to like, have that tight and, and crisp. Gotcha. And you said CCPA and what was the other one? Uh, GDPR. Right. And Thank like, you. if you don't go in, right, like selling data, if you don't go in knowing the data selling regulations, the data selling channels, the kind of profit people are making with selling data, like they're extra, not going to believe you. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I, have a, I have a bit of an odd question. We're also a bit more B2C. So, so maybe uh, dragging this a bit off topic, but um, basically what we're making is uh bank account that's playable and using the same mechanics that games use to typically get you to make in-app purchases um, to get people to compulsively save money instead. Um, so essentially we're trying to be people's, um, you know, primary checking account, their main bank account, um, but the sort of front facing interface and most of the incentives are through, um, you know, an actual, an actual game. So kind of think clash of clans or, like a city city builder type type game, um, but one of the challenges that we've had in pushing product and iterating is that you don't have the same type of leniency on like changing the product. So let's let's say for example, um, you know, we push out a version of the game and we get some users on, the users are, are, are enjoying it. And then we need to make a fundamental pivot where 
you know, say something like their game scores have to change because like the game mechanics change. So like, like an actual sort of, I, I guess we, what you could call in like the like crypto world, like a hard fork or like an actual kind of like split. How do you manage making sure that you have the flexibility to like create a better version of the product while also not having kind of the issue of, of lagging users on the old product or kind of that, that kind of. Yeah. I mean, I mean, straight up, like if you've got an app, that's going to change a lot. You better be working with a small group of beta users that understand that the app is changing a lot that you are in close contact with and that have like signed up for beta, right? Like, Hey, you know, in, in a lot of apps will have a, an application, a wait list. Like, Hey, like sign up to join the beta. Hey, welcome to the beta stuff is going to be changing all the time. Um, and ideally it's, it's close friends or people that like are really interested in just giving beta feedback. Um, yeah, like you, every app I've used that is changing a lot of the time is doing it in the context of a beta of a test flight. And even that's all clubhouse, right? Clubhouse was in test flight beta for a long time. Um, so that's what I would say, right? It's like, make sure that you're working with users that, you know, you have built that, that trust and, and patience with, and that are expecting big changes. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. You know, so like, cool like Ma- Maple, Maple, check. my app is changing a lot. And I tell people, hey, welcome to the beta. Join the beta. Like you are entering the beta. The, the logo says Maple beta. Like <laughs> uh, it reinforced. We used to do this at Palantir too. Any any feature we thought would change or was a little bit of act, we just say, oh, it's a beta feature. And then people, people kind of understand. Fair enough. But yeah, if they're signing up for a finance app, uh, I would imagine they would not expect it to change dramatically. <laughs> yeah, I guess fortunately the financial side doesn't change too much, um, but it, there is there is a component of like, you know, if somebody puts effort into a game and you have to do something that like ends up wiping their score in some way or like fundamentally changing the game mechanics, it's not like a, it's not like we're removing or adding a feature. Like it's it yeah. could be pretty, it's just like rough. And and that's what we talk about in the sales world. It's called a qualified lead. You say, oh, hey, you're, you're a good fit for our product as it is right now. Same thing in consumer. Like there's there's people that are a good fit, you know, let them off the wait list, let them in the beta. And there's people that aren't. Say, hey, wait for, for the general release. Awesome. So Bruno has to head out soon. So we're just going to take this one last question from Christian and then we'll wrap up. So Christian, try to be relatively brief with your question. Hey, Bruno, my name's Christian. I'm with Justin working on String. Um, I had a question about how you approach iteration based on user feedback. So I was wondering how you kind of implement these feedback systems with users and how do you go about testing based on user feedback? Thanks. Yeah, um, maybe give me a little bit of context. Like, well, what are you doing? You know, the consumers at enterprise so I can... Um, yeah, sure. Uh, we're working with consumers. We're the uh, social news app, a news aggregator with a social network on top. I'm with Justin. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, what I would say is actually one second. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I've done a couple betas uh, for consumer apps, and and usually, you know, there's some like in-app feedback prompts, but also there's um, you know, I'll get emails or, or even like um, yeah, email surveys from the founder. Be like, hey, um, you know, we just rolled out these features last week. Like, you know, you want to answer a couple of quick questions um, about um. You know, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'd say like finding one thing that works, or there's a couple of things that work really well, right? One is build those communication channels that are more async, you know, email, um, implement feedback in your app um, for sure, like kind of natively, like really like a easy way to solicit feedback. Um, and I'd say the other thing is like, can you build a community around it, right? These days, c- community is very in vogue. Right? Um, can you build a you know, Slack community, a Discord community, whatever, a, a Facebook group of like people that use this app? And, and you know, because if you build that community, you know, people are gonna you know, they're gonna talk about it. You kind of talk to each other, and right, and you learn from what they're talking about, what they're talking about with each other, what they're sharing. And so I'd say these days, community is very in vogue. Um, you can have, uh, you know, you could even do like, hey, like by signing up for the beta. You know, um, you can send them an invite to do a roundtable. Like, hey, do you, do you want to join a panel? You know, of like six users and, and get feedback. I'd say it depends on on what feedback you need, but you know, usually at the end of the day, it's like 
the metrics on your app, right? It's like you you improve what you measure, right? So you, you, usually I'd say the best feedback is just seeing what they're doing, seeing what they're not doing, pushing updates that are responsive to that, and then seeing how their behavior changes, right? Like at the end of the day, people can tell you one thing, but ultimately it's what they do that matters. And the apps I see that work best um, just kind of have really good metrics and, and kind of like push updates out to users. And um, oh man, I had another thought, but I just forgot it. But yeah, I'd say just like get creative and, and figure out like, how do you get the users to tell you what they're really thinking? But because if you if you do a survey, if you do a, a panel, right, they're probably not always going to tell you what they're really thinking and say what they want to hear. So either figure out how to get them to talk to each other or figure out how to just keep them engaged and, you know, see how they react to changes in the product. Oh, that's what I remembered. Um, something that always works really well is if you make it easy for them to file a, a feature request or a bug report and you respond to it, right? Like that, that's always really good. So at least for me, um, you know, because at Maple, we work with community managers. We always try to ask them when they onboard, hey, why are you using this? And what features would you want to see in the product? Such that we want to ship those features, we can get back to them and say, hey, actually, like we just shipped that feature. You said you were interested in this sort of thing. Um, so let's say, imagine uh, if I were you and, and you might say, hey, why are you signing up for this? If they say to make it easier, to share things with my friends. And when you ship out features that make sharing more easy, you can kind of specifically like send a note to those users and say, hey, you signed up, you know, to share things with your friends more easily. You know, here's a couple of new social features we added to, to give you that ability. So by honing in and, and making them feel like you're responsive to their feedback, they'll naturally want to give more feedback. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Bruno. I appreciate it. How can we uh, get in touch with you? And by the way, I was going to say, but I'm like not a consumer guy. So I'm like a very enterprise person. So we're just like advice uh, wise, obviously. So, but yeah, how to get in touch with me. Um, no, I was saying uh, as it pertains to my uh, advice earlier, uh, how to get in touch with me. Um, uh, Twitter is, is always easy. You can find me like at B5Euro, uh, DM me. That, that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me these days. First okay. initial, Great. last name. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, cool. Bruno. Uh, really appreciate you, you being so generous with your time and uh, hopefully we can send you some deals in the future. Hey, hope that was helpful guys. You have a good rest of your day. Thank you. All right. Take it easy. Hey.